Good day, everyone! Today, we will learn about Araling Panlipunan. In this discussion, you will learn about the Spanish-American War, the Battle of Manila Bay, the Malolos Congress, the Filipino-American hostilities, and the end of the Philippine Revolution. So here is the outline of our discussion. First, we will discuss the Spanish-American War. Second, we will discuss the Battle of Manila Bay. Third will be the Malolos Congress. Fourth is the Filipino-American hostilities. And fifth is the end of the Philippine Revolution. The U.S. Helps Cuba One year before the historic cry of Pugadlawin, a revolution broke out in Cuba, which is another Spanish colony that rose against the rampant abuses of the Spaniards. It became independent in 1898 after three years of revolt with the help of the United States. The Americans were supportive of the Cubans for various reasons. First, the U.S. is a free country and advocated democracy and freedom. Second, the U.S. wants to protect its huge economic interest in Cuba in the amount of 50 million U.S. dollars. Third, a lot of stories reached the United States about Spanish maltreatment of Americans living in Cuba, and this greatly angered the U.S. citizens. And fourth, since Cuba was located very near the U.S., it was deemed covered by the protective mantle of the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. Interest in the Philippines At that time, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt wanted a war to erupt between the U.S. and Spain so he could strengthen and expand the U.S. Navy. He immediately put his plan into place. On February 25, 1896, he ordered Commodore George Dewey to make Hong Kong the headquarters of the American Asiatic Squadron. He also directed Dewey to attack Manila Bay and destroy the Spanish fleet the moment hostilities between Spain and U.S. break out. The Spanish-American War Spain did not relish American intervention in its affairs. However, with the Philippine and Cuban revolutions going on, it could not afford to add the Americans to its enemy list, especially since the United States had more advanced technology and weaponry. In the face of Spain's declining power, it tried to repair its rift with the U.S. in order to avoid a disastrous war. On February 15, 1898, however, a fateful event accrued in Cuba. The American warship Maine was blown up in Havana Harbor, resulting in the death of its 260 officers and crew members. Although it was not proven that the Spaniards had sunk the Maine, the Americans called for war against Spain. Roosevelt was one of the many U.S. officials who considered the destruction of the Maine as the act of treason and supported the declaration of the war. Spain declared war on the United States on April 23, 1898. The United States declared war against Spain on April 25, 1898. On May 1, 1898, the United States Navy, led by Commodore George Dewey, crushed the Spanish squadron in Manila Bay and the Spanish naval base at Sangli Point in Cavite. By June 1898, the American had control of portions of the Philippine Islands. The Spanish-American War ended with the Treaty of Paris, signed on December 10, 1898. The treaty conferred ownership of the Spanish colonies of Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines to the United States. In turn, the U.S. paid Spain 20 million U.S. dollars. The 
The Battle of Manila Bay George Dewey, a Commodore United States Navy's Asiatic Squadron, was waiting in Hong Kong when he received a cable from the Secretary of Navy Theodore Roosevelt stating that the war had begun between the U.S. and Spain. Dewey sailed from Hong Kong on board his flagship Olympia with six other heavily armed ships. He brought with him a report on the location of the Spanish ships in Corregidor and Manila at dawn of May 1, 1898. Dewey entered Manila Bay almost undetected. When he saw the Spanish ships, which were under the command of General Patricio Montoya, he ordered his men to fire. The battle began at 5.41 in the morning and by 12.30 of the same day, the Spaniards were raising the white flag in surrender. Although the Spanish ships outnumbered those of the Americans, the weapons of the Americans were far more superior to those of the Spaniards. The battle proved to be too costly for the Spaniards, who lost 167 men and had 214 others wounded. As for the Americans, no ships were destroyed and no soldier was killed or injured. The Battle of Manila Bay is considered one of the easiest encounters ever won in world history. The Siege of Manila By June 1898, General Emilio Aguinaldo had captured the whole of Luzon and was ready to storm Manila with the help of Gregorio del Pilar, Artemio Ricarte, Antonio Montenegro, Pantaleon Garcia, and many other able generals. At that time, the term Manila referred to the walled city of Intramuros. Aguinaldo's men surrounded the walls of Intramuros. Nearby areas like Tondo, Santa Cruz, San Juan, and Caloocan were likewise secured. The Spaniards stubbornly hoped for the arrival of reinforcements from the Spanish mainland, but none ever came. Aguinaldo, on the other hand, was firmly convinced that it just was a matter of days before the Spaniards surrendered. Therefore, he started planning for the Declaration of Philippine Independence. The Malolos Congress Emilio Aguinaldo issued a decree on July 18, 1898, asking for the election of delegates to the Revolutionary Congress. Another decree was promulgated five days later, which declared that Aguinaldo would appoint representatives of Congress because holding elections is not practical at that time. He appointed 50 delegates in all, but this number fluctuated from time to time. In accordance with these two decrees, Aguinaldo assembled the Revolutionary Congress at the Barasoin Church in Malolos, Bulacan, on September 15, 1898. The atmosphere was festive and the Pasig band played the national anthem. After Aguinaldo had read his speech, congressional elections were held among the delegates present. The following were among the most important achievements of the Malolos Congress. First, in September 29, 1898, ratify the Declaration of Philippine Independence held at Kawit Cavite on June 12, 1898. Second, the passage of a law that allowed the Philippines to borrow 20 million pesos from banks for government expenses. Third, the establishment of the Universidad Literatura de Filipinas and other schools. Fourth, drafting of the Philippine Constitution. And fifth, declaring war against the United States on June 12, 1899. The Malolos Constitution A committee headed by Felipe Calderon and aided by Cayetano Arellano 
The Constitution was drafted for the first time by representatives of the Filipino people, and it is the first Republican Constitution in Asia. The Constitution was inspired by the Constitutions of Mexico, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Brazil, Belgium, and France. After some minor revisions, mainly due to the objections of Apolinario Mabini, the final draft of the Constitution was presented to Aguinaldo. This paved the way to launching the first Philippine Republic. It established a democratic republican government with three branches, the executive, legislative, and the judicial branches. It called for the separation of the church and state. The executive powers were to be exercised by the president of the republic with the help of his cabinet. Judicial powers were given to the Supreme Court and other lower courts to be created by the law. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was to be elected by the legislature with the concurrence of the President and his cabinet. The First Philippine Republic the First Philippine Republic was inaugurated in Malolos, Bulacan on January 21, 1899. After being proclaimed president, Emilio Aguinaldo took his oath of office. The constitution was read by article and followed by a military parade. Apolinario Mabini was elected as a prime minister. The other cabinet secretaries were Tedoro Sandico, the interior, Baldomero Aguinaldo for war, General Mariano Trias for finance and war, Apolinario Mabini for foreign affairs, Joshua Gonzaga for welfare, Aguedo Velarde for public instruction, Maximo Paterno for public works and communication, and Leon Maria Guerrero for agriculture, trade, and commerce. General Aguinaldo formed his Council of Government or Cabinet. All of them were Masons from different symbolic lodges of the Grande Oriente Español. The first picture is Apolinario Mabini, second is Mariano Trias, third is Baldomero Aguinaldo, fourth is Teodoro Sandico, and last picture is Gracio Gonzaga. The Philippine National Anthem Aguinaldo commissioned Julian Felipe, a composer from Cavite province, was asked to write an instrumental march for the proclamation of independence ceremony. The original title was Marcha Filipina Magdalo. This was later changed to Marcha Nacional Filipina. The lyrics was added in August 1899 based on the poem titled Filipinas by Jose Palma. The original lyrics was written in Spanish, then to English, when the flag law was abolished during the American period, then later was translated to Tagalog, which underwent another change of title to Lupang Hinirang, the Philippine National Anthem.
about the Philippine National Anthem. The National Anthem was heard publicly for the first time on June 12, 1898, when standing on the balcony of his Cowit Mansion, Aguinaldo proclaimed Asia's first independent republic before a cheering throng. Two rallying symbols were presented to the infant nation that day. Also displayed for the first time was the national flag unfurled to the steering strings of the Marcha Nacional played by the band of San Francisco de Malabon, now General Trias, whose members had learned the music the day before. But still without words, Felipe's music was simply a march. It could not be sung. The need for lyrics was just as great as there was for the music. In December 1898, the Philippines was ceded by Spain to the United States of America in the Treaty of Paris. Having thrown off Spanish rule, the Filipinos found themselves under new colonial masters, the Americans. In February of 1899, the Filipino-American War erupted. The defiant lyrics to march the steering strains of Felipe were supplied by Jose Palma, a 23-year-old soldier who was as adept with a pen as he was with a sword. He wrote a poem entitled Filipinas, and this was wed to the Felipe composition. The anthem was readily taken by the young nation at war, but on March 23, 1901, the war with American ground to a halt with the capture of Aguinaldo in Palanan, Isabella. The first half of the century were years of humiliation for the Filipinos and their anthem. The American administrators discouraged the singing of the anthem, and in the 1920s, Palma's original Spanish lyrics underwent several English and Tagalog translations. The most popular were the following versions, one in English by Camilo Osillas and M. A. L. Lane and one in Tagalog. In 1956, a new version penned by the Surian ng Wikang Pambansa, Institute of National Language, was adopted. These are the official Filipino lyrics sung all over the country today and given wider propagation through radio, television, and cinema. The Filipino-American Hostilities Emilio Aguinaldo agreed to hold a peace conference between Filipino and American leaders. The conference lasted from January 9 to 29 in 1899. It ended without definite results, because the Americans were actually just bidding time, waiting for more reinforcements to arrive from the U.S. Hostilities finally exploded between the Filipinos and Americans on February 4, 1899 in San Juan. An American soldier named Robert Grayson saw four armed Filipino men on San Juan del Monte Bridge and ordered them to stop, but they ignored him. This prompted Grayson to fire at the men, who immediately fired back. The following day, MacArthur ordered his troops to openly engage the Filipinos in battle. The Filipino-American War was on. From San Juan, American soldiers marched on to Pasig and nearby areas. In a matter of days, they were able to overrun Guadalupe, Pateros, Marikina, and Caloocan. General Antonio Luna and his men showed great heroism when they attacked Manila on the night of February 24, 1899. They burned the living quarters of the Americans in Tondo and Binondo and reached as far as Ascaraga Street, now Claro M. Recto Avenue, where they met by formidable American troops. 
Luna was forced to retreat to Polo Bulacan two days later. When American reinforcements arrived in the Philippines, General Elwell Otis immediately attacked the northern part of Manila while General Henry Lawton went to the south. General Arthur MacArthur Jr. marched to Malolos and was then the capital of the Philippine Republic. Malolos was taken on March 31, 1899. By this time, however, Aguinaldo had already moved his headquarters to San Fernando, Pampanga. General Frederick Funston crossed the Pampanga River in April 1899 and entered San Fernando. On May 5, the Americans had gained control of Pampanga. Fortunately, Aguinaldo was able to flee to San Isidro, Nueva Ecija. The Death of Antonio Luna A significant event that greatly weakened Aguinaldo's forces was the death of General Antonio Luna, acknowledged as the best and most brilliant military strategist of the Philippine Revolution. He was brave, intelligent, and well-educated, but he also had a fiery temper and was a strict disciplinarian. His harsh and rough manner earned him a lot of enemies who later plotted to kill him. In June 1899, Luna was at his command post in Bayambang, Pangasinan when he received a telegram allegedly sent by Aguinaldo. The telegram instructed him to proceed to Aguinaldo's headquarters in Cabanatuan, Nueva Ecija. On June 5, Luna arrived at the headquarters, a convent on the town plaza in Cabanatuan, but was told that Aguinaldo left for Tarlac. Angry, Luna went out of the convent and was met and killed by Captain Pedro Hanulino with Kawit Cavita troops. General Luna was buried at the nearby churchyard. Aguinaldo's role on his death is not clear, and his killers were never charged or investigated. Aguinaldo flees. Philippine military strategies began to fail with the death of Antonio Luna. The generals started to disagree among themselves and the Filipinos began losing battles. On November 13, 1899, General Emilio Aguinaldo fled to Calasiao, Pangasinan with his wife, son, mother, sister, and some cabinet members. The Americans followed in hot pursuit but Aguinaldo still managed to elude them. However, he soon realized that being constantly on the run put the women in his group at great disadvantage. So, on December 25, 1899, he surrendered them to the Americans. Aguinaldo then continued his march from Pangasinan to Palanan, Isabela. There he stayed for some time since the place was mountainous and difficult to approach. Aguinaldo's loyal men guarded all roads leading to the area. The End of the Philippine Revolution Aguinaldo is Captured General Funston plotted the capture of General Emilio Aguinaldo. On the night of March 6, 1901, he boarded the American warship Vicksburg and docked at Casiguran Bay on March 14. Funston's group reached Aguinaldo's headquarters in Palanan on March 23, 1901. The Macabebet scouts pretended to have been sent by Lacuna with the American officials as their prisoners. Thus, Aguinaldo had no idea of his impending capture until Hilario Tal Placido of the Macabebe Scouts embraced him. The Americans then declared the arrest of Aguinaldo and his men in the name of the United States government. Aguinaldo was brought to Manila 
and presented to the Military Governor General Arthur MacArthur Jr., the father of General Douglas MacArthur, at the Malacanang Palace. On April 19, 1901, he finally pledged allegiance to the United States. The Philippine Revolution Ends The first to yield to the Americans was by General Simeon Ola. He surrendered to Colonel Harry Bandoltz in Gunubatan, Albay, on September 25, 1903. Other revolutionaries soon followed. The Military Government General Wesley Merritt was the highest-ranking American official in the Philippines after Spaniards surrendered Manila on August 13, 1898. He established a military government and became the first American military governor of the Philippines. The objectives of the military government are first, to establish peace and order to the Philippines, and second, is to prepare Philippines for civil governance. The government in the Philippines can be classified into opposition and collaboration. The Americans use propaganda and other means to win the Filipinos to their side. The Sherman On January 20, 1899, the United States President William McKinley created the first Philippine Commission known as the Sherman Commission. This commission recommended establishment of a civil government, bicameral legislature, and a public school system in the Philippines. Its report also became the basis for the Second Philippine Commission's creation on July 4, 1901. The First Philippine Commission had Jacob Sherman as chairperson, and George Dewey, Elwell Otis, Dean Worcester, and Charles Tenby as members. In the proclamation of this special commission, President McKinley sent following statement of regulative principles to the commissioners. First is the supremacy of the United States must and will be enforced throughout every part of the archipelago and those who resist it can accomplish no end other than their own ruin. Second, to the Philippine people will be granted liberty and self-government reconcilable with maintenance of a wise, just, stable, effective, and economical administration of public affairs and compatible with the sovereign and international rights and obligations of the United States. The civil rights of the Philippine people will be guaranteed and protected to the fullest extent. Religious freedom will be assured and all persons shall be equal and have equal standing in the eyes of the law. Fourth, honor, justice, and friendship forbid the use of the Philippine people or the islands they inhabit as an object or means of exploitation. The purpose of the American government is the welfare and advancement of the Philippine people. Fifth, there shall be guaranteed to the Philippine people an honest and effective civil service in which, to the fullest extent to which it is practicable, natives shall be employed. Sixth, the collection and application of all taxes and other revenues will be placed upon a sound economical basis and the public funds raised justly and collected honestly will be applied only to defray the regular and proper expenses incurred by the establishment and maintenance of the Philippine government and such general improvements as the public interest may demand. Local funds collected will be used for local purposes and not devoted to other ends. With such prudent and honest fiscal administration, it is believed that the needs of the government will, 
in a short time become compatible with a considerable reduction in taxation. Seventh, a pure, speedy, and effective administration of justice will be established whereby may be eradicated the evils arising from delay, corruption, and exploitation. Eight, the construction of roads, railroads, and similar means of communication and transportation and of other public works manifestly to the advantage of the Philippine people will be promoted. Ninth, domestic and foreign trade and commerce, agriculture, and other industrial pursuits tending toward the general development of the country in the interest of the inhabitants shall be the objects of constant solicitude and fostering care. Tenth, effective provision will be made for the establishment of elementary schools in which the children of the people may be educated and appropriate facilities will be provided for a higher education. Eleventh, reforms in all departments of the government, all branches of the public service, and all corporations closely touching the common life of the people will be undertaken without delay and effected conformably with right and justice in a way to satisfy the well-founded demands and the highest sentiments and aspirations of the people. Such is the spirit in which the United States comes to the people of the islands and the President has instructed the Commission to make this publicly known. In obeying his behest, the Commissioners desire to join the President in expressing their goodwill toward the Philippine people and to extend to the leading representative men an invitation to meet them for the purpose of personal acquaintance and the exchange of views and opinions. And that's the end of our discussion. I hope you learned something. Thank you for watching.